Question 1.1 consists of three data handling questions, two finance questions, and one probability question. You are given a table that shows the cost of school uniforms at three different stores. In the first column, you are given the type of clothing items to be purchased. The second, third, and fourth column list the prices of each item for store A, B, and C. You are also given an unknown value P that will have to be calculated. Note that there are two pairs of socks in each pack. In question 111, you are instructed to identify whether the prices given in table 1 are numerical or categorical data. Categorical data is data that can be divided into groups or categories like the different items that needs to be purchased, while numerical data is data that is measured or counted like the prices of the different items. Since the question asks you to base your decision on the prices given in the table, you have to say that this data is numerical data. In question 112, you are instructed to arrange all the prices given for store B in ascending order. Ascending order means that you have to arrange the data from the lowest value to the highest value. The arrangement will look like this. In question 113, you have to give the name of the store that sells the cheapest grey shorts. From the table, the store that sells the cheapest grey shorts is store B. In question 114, you have to calculate the price of a pack of white school socks at store C. From the table, we can see that at store C, white socks is sold at a cost of 85 rand 99 cents for 5 packs. So the cost of 1 pack of white socks is 85 rand 99 cents divided by 5 packs, and this equals a cost of 17 rand 198 cents. Rounding this value to 2 decimal places will give you a cost of 17 rand 20 cents. In question 115, you have to determine the missing value P if Martha bought all the school items as advertised at store A. The cost of all the school items at store A are listed in the second column in the table. The total cost P equals the sum of all the prices in column 2. This will equal a total cost of 1,251.50. In question 116, it is stated that the probability of selecting store C to buy all the school items is 0, 0,3 recurring. In question 116a, you are asked to define the term probability in the given context. Here the context part is important and just giving the general definition of the term probability won't get you the marks. You have to give the definition of the term probability with reference to the given context. Here the term probability can be defined as the chance of randomly selecting store C out of all three stores. In question 116b, you are instructed to write down this probability as a percentage rounded to the nearest whole number. Since the probability is given as a decimal number, you have to multiply it by 100 to convert it to a percentage. So the probability as a percentage is equal to 0, 0,3 recurring multiplied by 100 and this equals a probability as a percentage of 33,3 .3 recurring percent. Rounding this value to the nearest whole number will give you a probability of 33%. Question 1.2 consists of four finance questions that were designed to assess your understanding of investment options in the South African context. You are given two stock fail options, Plan A and Plan B, in Table 2. Plan A is a monthly fixed term plan for a period of 24 months. The monthly contribution for this plan is 2,500 and the total amount at the end of the 24-month period is predicted to be 74,286.84. Plan B is a once-off saving plan for a period of 24 months. It requires a once-off investment amount of 60,000 rand and the total amount at the end of the 24-month period is predicted to be 92,065 rand 71 cents. In question 1 to 1, you have to define investment in the given context. An investment in this context is the action or process of contributing money to a stock fail plan with the intention of earning a return on that contribution. In question 1 to 2, you are instructed to calculate the total contribution for plan A over a 24-month period. From plan A, the monthly contribution is 2,500 for a period of 24 months. So the total contribution equals 2,500 rand multiplied by 24 months and this equals a total contribution of 60,000 rand. 
In question 1, 2, 3, you have to calculate the interest earned if the person invests in plan B over a period of 24 months. From the table for plan B, the total contribution is 60,000 Rand and a total amount earned after 24 months is 92,065 Rand 71 cents. So the interest earned over the two year period is 92,065 Rand 71 cents minus 60,000 Rand and this equals an interest earned of 32,065 Rand 71 cents. In question 1 to 4, you have to determine how much more interest a person will earn investing in plan B compared to investing in plan A over the same 24 month period. For both plans, a total contribution of 60,000 Rand is required, but you will earn more money from plan B compared to plan A. So the difference in the total interest earned is 92,065 Rand 71 cents minus 74,286 Rand 84 cents. And this equals a difference of 17,778 Rand 87 cents. Question 1.3 consists of two data handling questions and one finance question that were designed to assess your understanding of compound bar graphs. You are given a compound bar graph that shows in cents per liter the price of three types of fuel in Gauteng for the first three months of 2022. In question 131, you are instructed to name the type of graph that is drawn above. The type of graph that is drawn here is a compound bar graph. In question 132, you have to identify the type of fuel that costs the most in February 2022. From the graph, the type of fuel that costs the most in February 2022 is 95 unleaded petrol. In question 133, it is stated that the price of diesel in March 2022 was 1,955 Rand 28 cents per liter. You have to write this price in Rand per liter rounded to the nearest 50 cents. There is 100 cents in 1 Rand, so 1,955 Rand 28 cents per liter equals 1,955 Rand 28 divided by 100 and this equals a price of 19 Rand 55 cents per liter. Rounding this value to the nearest 50 cent will give you a price of 19 Rand 50 cent per liter. Question 2.1 consists of seven finance questions that were designed to assess your understanding of financial statements in the context of an insurance policy. You are given a summary of a vehicle and household insurance policy in Annex A. You will have to use this policy document to answer the questions that follow. In question 2.1, you have to write down the policy number of this person's insurance policy. From Annex A, the policy number can be read off here as 2338350. In question 212, you are instructed to determine the missing value A, which is the monthly premium for the VW Polo. From Annex A, the total monthly premium, including discount, equals 2184.21. The missing value A is equal to the difference between the total monthly premium and the sum of the breakdown that makes up this total monthly premium. So the missing value A equals 2,184.21 minus the sum of the premium details plus the total discount and this equals a premium of 1,355.06. In question 213, it is stated that Bonvana qualifies for a discount on his insurance premiums as he has insured many items. You will have to calculate the percentage discount that he receives if the total premium before the discount was 2,450.36. From Annex A, the total discount is given as 266.15. This value as a percentage of the monthly premium before the discount is 266.15 divided by 2450.36 multiplied by 100 and this equals a percentage of 10.86%. In question 214, it is stated that Bomvana was involved in a motor vehicle accident during July 2022. The quotation for the damages from the panel beta was 43,520 Rand. You will have to determine the amount the insurance company will pay the panel beaters.
From Annexure A, there is a note at the bottom of the policy document with regards to the excess that is payable on certain types of claims. An excess in regards to insurance claims refers to the amount of money that a policyholder agrees to pay out of their own pocket before the insurance company begins to cover the remaining costs. In other words, it's the amount of money that the policyholder is responsible for paying towards the claim they make. Since the claim is for a motor vehicle accident, the excess that this person must pay is 7,000 Rand. Therefore, the amount the insurance company will pay the panel beaters is the difference between the total cost of the claim of 43,520 Rand minus the excess which must be paid by Bompana of 7,000 Rand and this equals an amount of 36,520 Rand. In question 215, you are instructed to calculate the amount of VAT included in the total monthly premium. On Annex A, the total monthly premium including 15% VAT is given as 2,184.21. This amount as a percentage equals 115%. This is because the VAT inclusive percentage of 115% equals the VAT percentage of 15% plus the VAT exclusive percentage of 100%. Now, if you need to calculate the VAT amount and you are given the VAT inclusive amount, you can use the following formula. VAT amount equals the VAT inclusive amount multiplied by 15% VAT divided by 115% VAT inclusive. So, the VAT amount equals the VAT inclusive amount of 2,184.21 multiplied by 15 over 115 and this equals 284.90. In question 216, it is stated that the premium for the Toyota Corolla is much lower than that of the VW Polo. You are asked to give one possible reason for the big difference in the premium amount. One reason that you can give is that the Toyota is an older model vehicle compared to the VW Polo. That means that the older model vehicle will cost less to replace or repair. In question 217, it is stated that this person pays a My Home premium for household content cover to the value of 200,000 Rand. After the household contents were evaluated for insurance purposes, he bought an additional lounge suite. You are asked to explain how the purchase of this new item will affect his My Home Content Premium. The effect that this will have on his My Home Content Premium is that his premium will increase as his household content value will increase to more than 200,000 Rand. Question 2.2 consists of four finance questions that were designed to assess your understanding of water tariffs. It stated that Johannesburg uses the area of a property to determine the sanitation bill, while Cape Town uses a percentage of the total water usage to determine the sanitation bill, which is the same way as they calculated the water bill. Table 3 shows the tariffs for Johannesburg excluding VAT and Cape Town including VAT. In question 221, you have to write down to the nearest 10 cents and excluding that, the cost of sanitation in Johannesburg if the property is 175 square meters. According to Table 3, in Johannesburg, if a property is less than 300 square meters, the cost for sanitation is equal to 228.6 cents, excluding that. Rounding this value to the nearest 10 cents will give you a cost of 228 rand 10 cents. In question 222, you are instructed to calculate the cost of 4,1 kiloliters of sanitation in Cape Town before the increase. According to table 3, the tariff rates after the increase are given in this column. This column indicates how much the tariff increased by. In the first step, there is an increase of 66 cents. So the tariff for this step was 16 rand 3 cents per kiloliter minus 66 cents per kiloliter, and this equals a tariff of 15 rand 37 cents per kiloliter. So the cost of 4,1 kiloliters of water in Cape Town is 4,1 kiloliters multiplied by the tariff of 15 rand 37 cents per kiloliter. And this equals a cost of 63 Rand 2 cents.
A question 223, it is stated that Mr. Jones lives in Johannesburg and Miss Brown lives in Cape Town. They both own a property with an area of 550 square meters and each was billed for 22 kiloliters of sanitation. You are instructed to use the table above to determine the difference in the cost of sanitation for the two properties. First, you have to calculate the sanitation bill for Mr. Jones who lives in Johannesburg. Mr. Jones owns a property of 550 square meters. From the table, properties that are larger than 300 square meters up to a maximum of 1,000 square meters have to pay a flat rate excluding VAT of 443 Rand 96 cents. This value including VAT is equal to the cost excluding VAT of 443 Rand 96 cents multiplied by the VAT inclusive percentage of 115% divided by the VAT exclusive percentage of 100% and this equals a cost including VAT of 510 Rand 55 cents. Next we will have to calculate the sanitation bill for Ms. Brown who lives in Cape Town. This tariff table will be used to calculate Ms. Brown's sanitation bill. Since Ms. Brown uses a total of 22 kiloliters of water per month, we will have to calculate the cost for each step up to the amount of 22 kiloliters, which is in step 3. So for step 1, the maximum amount of water that was used in this step was 4,2 kiloliters. So the cost for step 1 will be 4,2 kiloliters multiplied by 16 rand 3 cents per kiloliter and this equals a cost of 67 rand 33 cents. For step 2, the maximum amount of water that was used in this step was the maximum amount of water in the step of 7,35 kiloliters minus the maximum amount of water in the previous step of 4,2 kiloliters and this equals 3,15 kiloliters. So the cost for step 2 will be 3,15 kiloliters multiplied by 22 rand 2 cents and this equals 69 rand 36 cents. For step 3, the amount of water that was used equals 22 kiloliters minus the maximum amount of water in the previous step of 7,35 kiloliters and this equals an amount of 14,65 kiloliters. So the cost for step 3 will be 14,65 kiloliters multiplied by 30 rand 92 cents. And this equals a cost of 452 rand 98 cents. The total cost of all three steps is equal to the sum of all three steps. This equals a total cost including that of 589 rand 67 cents. Now the difference in the sanitation bills of Ms. Brown and Mr. Jones is 589 Rand 67 cents minus 510 Rand 55 cents and this equals a difference of 79 Rand 12 cents. In question 2 to 4, you have to explain how the tariff system used in Johannesburg is beneficial to homeowners in terms of water usage. In Johannesburg, your sanitation is calculated based on your property size and not the amount of water you use. It is a fixed rate that allows you to use as much as you can for the same amount of cost. Question 3.1 consists of five data handling questions that were designed to assess your understanding of data analysis. You are given a table that shows the number of people per province working in two workplaces. Namely, usual workplace, abbreviated UWP, and work from home, abbreviated WFH. The data is given for the last quarter of 2020 and the first quarter of 2021. In question 311, you have to show how the total value of 83,5 for South Africa was calculated. The total value of 83,5 for the work from home for the first quarter of 2021 was calculated by finding the sum of all the people from all provinces that worked from home. The sum of the number of people that worked from home in South Africa in the first quarter of 2021 will equal 83,5. In question 312, you have to give one reason why the values in the table will differ from actual workplace values. From the table, we see the values here are given in tens of thousands. 
So this means that the values in the table will be rounded to the nearest 10,000. So the reason why the values in the table will differ from the actual values in the workplace is because the values in the table are given in tens of thousands or due to the rounding of actual values to the nearest 10,000. In question 313, you have to write down the number of people who worked at the usual workplace in Gauteng during the first quarter of 2021. From the table, we see that the number of people that worked at the usual workplace in Gauteng is given as 365,9. This value needs to be multiplied by 10,000 because the values in the table are given in 10,000s. This will give you a total number of people that worked in the workplace in Gauteng of 3,659,000. In question 314, you have to give one example of a job that cannot be done by working from home. Some of the jobs that cannot be done from home could be a doctor working in the medical sector, a police officer or security guard working in the security sector, or a cashier working in the essential services, or a construction worker like a plumber, electrician or builder working in the construction sector, or a farmer working in the agricultural sector. In question 315, you have to calculate the mean number of people in the work from home category for South Africa in the last quarter of 2020. The mean, also known as the average, is the sum of the values in a data set divided by the number of values in that data set. The number of people in the work from home category for South Africa in the last quarter of 2020 is given by these values in the data set. So the mean will equal the sum of these values divided by the number of values in the data set of 9 because there are 9 provinces in South Africa. And this will give us a mean number of people in the work from home category for South Africa in the last quarter of 2020 of 10,34444. This value must now be multiplied by 10,000 to give us an actual mean value of 103,444,4. Question 3.2 consists of four data handling questions that were designed to assess your understanding of data analysis and compound bar graphs. It is stated that South Africa's unemployment rate increased by 34.4% in quarter 2 to 34.9% in quarter 3 of 2021. The number of unemployed people in quarter 2 was 7.6 million, which is 183,000 less than in quarter 3. You are given a graph that indicates the unemployment rate for different genders and the total for South Africa for the first quarter of 2021. The top bar of all three quarters represents the unemployment rate of South Africans, that is, both males and females combined. The middle bar of all three quarters represents the unemployment rate of women in South Africa, and the lowest bar of all three quarters represents the unemployment rate of men in South Africa. In question 3 to 1, you have to write down the quarter which shows the highest rate of unemployed men. From the graph, we see that the quarter that showed the highest unemployment rate for men was quarter 3. In question 3 to 2, you have to calculate the number of unemployed people in quarter 3. From the information given in question 3.2, we see that the number of unemployed people in quarter 2 was 7,6 million. This was 183,000 less than quarter 3. So the total number of people that were unemployed in quarter 3 was 7,600,000 plus 183,000. And this gives us a total number of people that were unemployed in quarter 3 of 7,783,000. In question 3 to 3, you have to determine the increase in percentage of unemployed women from quarter 1 to quarter 3 in 2021. From the graph, we see that the unemployment rate of women in quarter 1 can be read off the graph as 34%. While the unemployment rate of women in quarter 3 can be read of the graph as 37,4%.
So the increase in the percentage of the unemployment rate of women from quarter 1 to quarter 3 in 2021 is given as the difference between quarter 3 of 37.4% and quarter 1 of 34%. And this equals an increase in the percentage of unemployed women from quarter 1 to quarter 3 in 2021 of 3.4%. In question 3 to 4, it is stated that the unemployment rate for quarter 2 was 34.4%. You are instructed to determine the number of people employed in South Africa during quarter 2. We have to consider that the total number of people that can be employed in South Africa as a percentage is 100%. And 34.4% of those people are unemployed in quarter 2. It was also given that the total number of people that were unemployed in South Africa in quarter 2 was 7,6 million. Now the first step is to determine the total number of people that could potentially be employed given that those people as a percentage equals 100%. To find that value we will use the information that was given to us that is 7,600,000 unemployed people equals 34,4%. We can write these ratios in the following way. The total number of employable people over the total unemployed people of 7,600,000 equals the percentage of people that could potentially be employed of 100 over the percentage of people who are unemployed of 34,4%. Now multiplying both sides of this equation by 7,600,000 will give us an equation that simplifies to the total number of people that can be employed in South Africa in quarter 2 equal to the total number of employable people as a percentage of 100 divided by the total unemployed people as a percentage of 34,4% multiplied by the number of people that were unemployed in quarter 2 of 7,600,000 and this equals a total number of people that has the potential to be employed in quarter 2 of 22,093,023,26. But you can't get 0, 0,26 of a person, so rounding this value to the nearest whole person will give you 22,093,023. So the number of people that are employed in quarter 2 will be the difference between the total number of people that has the potential to be employed of 22,093,023 and the total number of people that are unemployed of 7,600,000 and this will equal a total number of people that were employed in quarter 2 of 14,493,023. Question 4.1 consists of two finance questions and one probability question that was designed to assess your understanding of personal income tax. It is stated that Mr. Lowe, aged 53, earns an annual taxable income of 495,602 rand for the year ending 28th of February 2022. And it doesn't contribute to any medical aid. In question 4 and 1, the following formula can be used to calculate the annual taxable income payable before rebate. That is, the annual tax payable before rebate equals 115,762 Rand plus 36% multiplied by the difference between the annual taxable income and 488,700. You are instructed to use the formula to calculate Mr. Lowe's annual tax payable before rebate. From the context of 4.1, we see that Mr. Lowe earns a taxable income of 495,602 Rand. Substituting this value in the given formula will give us the following equation. The annual tax payable before rebate equals 115,762 Rand plus 36% multiplied by the difference between his annual taxable income of 495,602 Rand and 488,700 Rand. This will give us an annual tax payable before rebate of 118,246 Rand 72 cents. In question 412, Mr. Lowe feels that the monthly tax payable is an easy option for him to calculate his monthly tax payable. 
Table 5 shows the monthly deductions for three income categories for the year ending 28th February 2022. It is stated that the monthly rebate for a person younger than 65 years old is 1,368.75 cents. You will have to verify showing all calculation whether his monthly tax will be correct according to the monthly deduction table. From question 411, we calculated that his annual tax payable before rebate was 118,246.72 cents. This means that his monthly tax payable will be 118,246.72 cents divided by the 12 months of the year and this will give us a monthly tax payable before rebate of 9,853.89 cents. Since he is younger than the age of 65 years, he qualifies for a monthly rebate of 1,368.75 cents. This means that his monthly tax payable will be his monthly tax before rebate of 9,853.89 cents minus the monthly rebate of 1,368.75 cents. And this will give us a monthly tax deductible after rebate of 8,485.14. The next step of this question is to determine the monthly tax deduction using Table 5. Then we have to make a comparison between the calculated monthly tax after rebate and the monthly tax deduction amount that was determined from Table 5. It is given that Mr. Lowe has an annual taxable income of 495,602 rand. This means that his monthly taxable income will be 495,602 rand divided by 12 months of the year. And this equals a monthly taxable income before rebate of 41,300 rand and 17 cents. From Table 5, we see that if he earns a monthly taxable income before rebate of 41,300 rand he will fall into the second income category because 41,300 rand is between the monthly taxable income range of 41,292 rand and 41,342 rand. Now, since he's under the age of 65 years, he will have a monthly tax payable after rebate of 8,491 Rand. Now that we have determined his tax payable using Table 5, we can now compare the two values of the calculated monthly tax after rebate of 8,485 Rand and 14 and the monthly tax deduction of the rebate that was determined from Table 5 of 8,491 Rand. Since the calculated monthly tax of the rebate does not equal the tax deduction of the rebate that was determined from Table 5, we have to make the statement that his statement is incorrect. Not making this final statement will result in you forfeiting one mark. In question 413, you have to write down the probability of selecting a monthly tax amount of 8,473 Rand for a person over the age of 75 years. From the monthly tax table provided in question 412, we see that this column lists the monthly tax deductible amount for individuals over 75 years of age. We see that there is no monthly tax deduction for any category of monthly income that equals 8,473 Rand. For this reason, we have to say that there is a 0% chance of selecting a monthly tax amount of 8,473 Rand for a person over the age of 75 years. Question 4.2 consists of five data handling questions, one finance question and one probability question that were designed to assist your understanding of pie charts, ratios, calculations of median and interquartile range of a data set and inflation rates. You are given three pie charts in Annex B that compares the five best selling vehicles in South Africa, America and Canada in 2021. In question 4 to 1, you have to write down in words the total number of vehicles sold in America. 
From the table, we see that the total number of vehicles sold in America was 2,584,176. This number can be written like this. 2,584,176. In question 422, you have to express in the form of a ratio of three numbers the number of Toyota RAV4 sold in America Canada and South Africa respectively. Here the word respectively is important. It means that you have to write down the ratios in the order of America first, Canada second and then South Africa. From the pie chart in Annex B we see that the total number of Toyota RAV4 vehicles sold in America was 407,739. In Canada, it was 61,934 and in South Africa, it was 36,085. Writing these values as a three-numbered ratio will give us 407,739 to 61,934 to 36,085. In question 423, you are instructed to write down the median number of best-selling vehicles in South Africa. Now, the median of a data set is the number in that data set that divides the data into two equal groups of values. The first step in determining the median is to arrange the values of the data set in ascending order. From the pie chart in Annex B, we see that the number of vehicles sold for each type of vehicle are given in the pie chart segments. For the pie chart of South Africa, we see that the numbers are arranged in ascending order in a counterclockwise direction. From the Isuzu D-Max of 16,426 to the Toyota RAV4 of 36,085. So these values can be written in ascending order like this. Systematically eliminating the numbers from both ends of the data set will give us the value of 19,077 as the median of this data set. In question 424, you are instructed to determine the number of Ford F-Series vehicles sold in Canada. The number of Ford F-Series vehicles that were sold in Canada will be the difference between the total number of vehicles sold in Canada of 357,243 and the sum of the number of vehicles that were given in the pie chart. And this equals the number of Ford F-Series vehicles that were sold in Canada of 116,401. In question 4 to 5, it is stated that the interquartile range for the top 10 vehicles sold in South Africa is 7,669 and the value of quartile 1 is 11,408. You have to calculate the value of quartile 3. Now the interquartile range is the difference between quartile 3 and quartile 1 of the data set. So the formula for calculating the interquartile range can be written like this. The interquartile range equals quartile 3 minus quartile 1. Now substituting the values of the interquartile range of 7669 and the value of quartile 1 of 11408 into the formula will give us the following equation. The interquartile range of 7669 equals quartile 3 minus quartile 1 of 11408. Now adding 11,408 to both sides of this equation and then simplifying will result in the following equation. 11,408 plus 7,669 equals quartile 3. Quartile 3 can then be calculated to be 19,077. In question 4 to 6, it is stated that the inflation rate in America for 2021 was 7%. And in 2020, it was 1,4%. The price of the Ford F-Series vehicle in 2022 was $32,332. It is stated that the Ford F-Series vehicle in 2020 was more than $29,800. You are instructed to verify showing all calculations whether the statement is valid. 
Since the price of the Ford F-Series vehicle in 2022 was $32,332 and there was a 7% increase on the price of this vehicle over the year of 2021, the price of the Ford F-Series vehicle in 2021 will be the price of the vehicle in 2022 of $32,332 multiplied by 100 divided by 100 plus the 7% increase over the year of 2021. And this will equal the cost of the vehicle in 2021 of $30,216.82. Now the price of the Ford F-Series vehicle in 2020 will be the price of the vehicle in 2021 multiplied by 100 over 100 plus the 1,4% increase in the price of the vehicle in 2020 and this will equal the price of the Ford F-Series vehicle in 2020 of $29,799.63. Since the price of the Ford F-Series vehicle in 2020 of $29,799.63 is less than the stated $28,000, we have to write down that the statement is invalid. Not making this last statement will result in you forfeiting one mark. In question 4 to 7, you are instructed to determine as a percentage the probability of purchasing a Ram pickup truck in America. From the pie chart for the vehicles sold in America, the number of Ram pickups sold in 2021 was 569,388. We also know that the total number of vehicles sold in America in 2021 was 2,584,176. So the probability of purchasing a Ram pickup in America in 2021 will be the number of Ram pickup vehicles sold of 569,388 divided by the total number of vehicles sold in America in 2021 of 2,584,176, multiplied by 100, and this will give us a probability of purchasing a Ram pickup vehicle in America in 2021 of 22,03%. Question 5.1 consists of four data handling questions and one finance question that were designed to assess your understanding of line graph and statistics. It is stated that during the 2008 to 2012 period, South Africa recorded an average growth rate of just over 2%. This was largely due to the global economic recession. Gauteng, KwaZulu Natal, and the Western Cape collectively contributed to a significant portion of the country's growth. The graph shows the contributions of these provinces towards the different sectors. The four sectors that are given are finance, transport, wholesale and agriculture. The graph of Gauteng is given by the dashed line, Western Cape is given by the dotted line and KwaZulu Natal is given by the solid line. In question 511, you have to write down the province that contributed the most to the wholesale sector. From the graph, we see that the Western Cape contributed the most to the wholesale sector. In question 512, it is stated that the total amount contributed by the three provinces to the agriculture sector was 8.3 billion rand. You are instructed to determine which part of this amount Western Cape contributed. From the graph, we see that the Western Cape and KwaZulu Natal each contributed 4% towards the agricultural sector while Gauteng contributed an estimated 3% towards the agricultural sector. This means that the total percentage contributed to the sector will be the sum of these three provinces. So the total percentage that was contributed to the agricultural sector from these three provinces is 11%, which equals a rand value of 8,3 billion rand. So the total amount that the Western Cape contributed towards the agricultural sector as a RAND value would be 4 over 11 multiplied by the total amount contributed by these three provinces of 8,3 billion RAND and this equals a contribution by the Western Cape of 3,018,181,818 RAND. In question 513, you have to identify the sector in which KwaZulu-Natal made a 12% contribution. 
From the graph, we see that the sector that was in Natal contributed 12% to was transport. In question 514, you have to name the sector that has the largest range. Now, the definition of range of a data set is the difference between the highest value and the lowest value in that data set. Comparing the ranges of the four sectors on the graph, we see that finance has the largest range. This will be the difference between the Western Cape of about 23% and Guazulu Natal of about 15%. In question 515, you have to name one province that made the most significant contribution towards the growth of most of the sectors. From the graph, we see that the Western Cape on average has the highest percentage contribution for each of the sectors. So we have to state that the Western Cape is the province that contributed the most growth to these sectors. Question 5.2 consists of four finance questions and one data handling question that were designed to assess your understanding of exchange rates. It is stated that Ryan is a South African citizen who owns a company in South Africa and wants to buy shares in a company in Canada. Table 6 shows the exchange rates of five countries on the 17th of March 2022. The currencies that are given are the Euro, the British Pound, the Japanese Yen, the Canadian Dollar and the Russian Ruble. You have to use the table to answer the questions that follow. In question 5 to 1, you have to identify the currency which is the weakest against the Rand. From table 6, we see that the country that is the weakest against the Rand would be the Japanese Yen as it costs 7,9596 Japanese Yen for 1 Rand or 0, 0,12565 Rand for 1 Japanese Yen. In question 522, you have to show how the Russian ruble of 0, 0,143373 Rand per unit was determined. From table 6, we see that 1 Rand will get you 6,97481 rubles. Since one unit of South African Rand will get you more Russian rubles, we say that the Russian ruble is weaker than the Rand. This also means that one Russian ruble will get you less units of South African Rand. To calculate the Russian ruble of 0, 0,143373 South African Rands, we have to say that one Russian ruble divided by 6,97481 South African Rands equals 0, 0,143373 South African Rands per unit of ruble. In question 523, Ryan decides to invest 1,230,000 Rand in shares in a Canadian company. You are instructed to convert 1,230,000 Rand into Canadian dollars. Since 1 Rand equals 0, 0,084845 Canadian dollars, 1,230,000 Rand will equal 1,230,000 multiplied by 0, 0,084845 Canadian dollars and this will give us an amount of 104,359,35 Canadian dollars. In question 524, you have to give one reason why you would motivate Ryan to invest in a Canadian company. One reason could be that the Canadian currency is stronger and therefore you will get a better return on his investment. In question 525, it is stated that after 2 years and 8 months, Ryan sold his shares and received a final amount of 1,529,360 Rand. In South Africa, Ryan would have received an interest rate of 8,1% compounded annually for 2 years and 8 months. Ryan stated that he earned more than 14,000 Rand return on his foreign investment compared to a potential South African investment. You will have to verify showing all calculations whether Ryan's statement is valid. To solve this problem, we first have to calculate the return on investment that Ryan would have received if he invested in a South African company for 2 years and 8 months at an interest rate of 8,1% compounded annually. Then we will have to find the difference between his foreign investment and the potential earnings of his South African investment. If the difference is more than 14,000 Rand, his statement would be valid. If not, his statement is invalid. 
So the amount of interest earned in year one would be the investment amount of 1,230,000 multiplied by the annual interest rate of 8,1 over 100. And this will give us an amount of interest earned in year one of 99,630 rand. Now the total investment amount after one year will be the original principal amount of 1,230,000 rand plus the interest amount that was earned of 99,630 rand and this will give us a new principal amount at the start of year 2 of 1,329,630 rand. Next we have to calculate the interest that was earned over the period of year 2. So the interest earned over the period of year 2 would be the principal amount at the beginning of year 2 of 1,329,630 rand multiplied by the annual interest rate of 8,1 over 100 and this would give us an interest earned at the end of year 2 of 107,700 rand and 3 cents. So the total invested amount after year 2 will now be the principal amount at the beginning of year 2 of 1,329,630 rand plus the interest that was earned over the period of year 2 of 107,700 rand and 3 cents and this will give us a new principal amount at the beginning of year 3 of 1,437,330 rand and 3 cents. Next we have to calculate the amount of interest that was earned over the 8 month period in year 3. Since we are given the annual interest rate which is the yearly interest rate, we first have to calculate the interest rate over the 8 month period first in order to determine the interest that was earned over that 8 month period. So the interest rate over the 8 month period will be the annual interest rate of 8,1 multiply by 8 months divided by the 12 months of a year and this will give us an interest rate over the 8 month period of 5,4%. So the interest earned over the 8 month period will be the principal amount at the beginning of year 3 of 1,437,330 rand and 3 cents multiply by 5,4 over 100 and this will give us an interest earned over the 8 month period of year 3 of 77,615 rand, 82162 cents. So the final amount at the end of the 2 years and 8 month period that Ryan would have, have invested in the South African company would be the principal amount at the beginning of year 3 of 1,437,330 rand and 3 cents plus the interest amount over the 8 month period in year 3 of 77,615 rand comma 82162 cents and this will give us a final amount of 1,514,945 rand comma 852 cents. Now remember this is the final amount that Ryan would have in his investment account if he had invested in a South African company at an annual interest rate of 8,1% compounded annually over the 2 year and 8 month period. Now to determine whether he would have earned more than 14,000 Rand from his foreign investment compared to the potential South African investment, we now have to find the difference between the foreign investment of 1,529,316 Rand and the potential final amount if he had invested in a South African company of 1,514,945 rand, 852 cents. And this will give us a difference of 14,414 rand and 15 cents. Since the amount is more than 14,000 rand as stated by Ryan, we have to say that his statement is valid. Not making this final statement will result in you forfeiting one mark. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. And if you found this video helpful, you can subscribe to be notified of more videos like this. And you can check out this video next.